Hi everyone, this is Al Rapp from the Office of Alumni Relations. Thank you for joining us for today's Career Strategy webinar. We're really happy to have Anne Grieves from the Office of Career Development here with us um, as an expert in this area and to share this useful topic. She's an assistant director in Northeastern's Career Development Office and Anne also has a private career coaching practice. Through assessments and in-depth conversations with people of all ages and backgrounds, Anne helps individuals explore career paths for professional fulfillment and success. She's a certified strengths finder and Myers-Briggs type indicator administrator and enjoys using these assessments to help people gain the self-awareness they need to successfully navigate and enjoy their careers. So I'm going to turn it over to Anne. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, first of all, can everybody press the uh, the raising the hand symbol on their screen if you can hear me. Okay, okay great. Vanessa, um, if you can't hear me, can you send a chat? Um, Maybe it's your volume, but the others, if, if at any point hear me, just write it in the chat. So welcome. I'm really excited to present uh, the Strength Finder uh, overview for all of you. Um, the, I have been using this for maybe a year and a half now with uh, alums, students, graduate students, and I see a lot of application uh, to the job search and in general on reaching professional and personal goals. So uh, I'm glad that you're joining us for part one. We will be offering part two next week, and I'll tell you more about that um, at the end of this workshop. So just to start, again, if you can hand, if you've heard of the Strength Finder before, if you've done it before. OK. OK, so some of you have some familiarity with it. Great. Okay, so at, at any point, feel free to type in questions as well, and uh, hopefully we'll get that answered for you. Um, so just to quickly go through the goals for this session is to give you a brief introduction of the Strength Finder. It's also called the Strength Quest in the university setting, but it's the same thing. Um, we're going to help you understand the power of your the five words that you got on your report. I don't think everyone has their report, so if you have not yet taken it, I really encourage you to take it um, after today, especially if you'll be joining us next week, because it's going to really help you understand and give you the insights uh, of what you can do with the knowledge that you, you know, from um, having these five strengths. We're going to show you how to uh, work with others and communicate with others and what it means to partner with other people with different strengths, and then how you can be more intentional about applying your strengths to everyday life so that you're happier uh, at work and in life. Um, so the strength, this is a pyramid. Uh, it starts with the strength integrity and who am I. And this is understanding who we are. What are we good at? What drives us? What is the one thing we need every day to thrive, whether it's personally or professionally? So really getting that insight. Uh, then it's a combination of the five strengths that really makes you unique. I think uh, Michelle had sent out a video in preparation for this, and it talks about how the chances of you meeting somebody with the same five strengths in the same order is 133 million. So this is something that really gives you uh, your unique ability to do something differently from somebody else. So when I do this, uh, when I do sessions for different people who are in different Roles, like project manager or even you know different engineers, they all approach their tasks in very different ways. So one person with one set of strengths is a very different project manager from somebody else. So being able to articulate that to yourself and to future employers, uh, if you're doing informational interviews or even regular interviews, is just really important to understand how you achieved success in the past using your strengths and how can you do that in the future. And so having that understanding and knowing 
how to apply your strengths towards reaching your goals in your own way is what will make you successful. So it's sort of this knowledge builds on itself. Um, so we talk about that people can excel at anything if they try hard enough. Uh, but because we're so unique and you know the chances of you meeting someone is one in 33 million, yes, there are certain things that you do better than others. So the things that aren't in our dominant strengths aren't necessarily the weaknesses. And we always focus on our weaknesses and improving our weaknesses. But if we learn how to leverage our strengths and really nurture them, that's when you're going to be able to achieve success. So it's this first beginning is understanding the natural, the strengths which are, it starts with the talents and then by nurturing them they, be, they become strengths. So once you do that, um, the, compared with those who do not get to focus on what they do best, people who have the opportunity to use their strengths are six times as likely to be engaged in their jobs and more than three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life, which is what we all want, right? Um, any any comments, questions so far? I'm trying to check the chat box. Okay. All right. So when we think about talents, you know, it's not necessarily anything athletic or artistic. Um, thanks, Samantha. So you'll see in a, in just a few moments how the strengths play out for us in everyday life. But when we talk about talents and then intern strengths, these are some of the examples. So the people that are great at starting conversations with strangers, that is a strength. So uh, being able to think in a very organized way, some people do that really well. Again, that's a strength. So these are just a few examples of strengths that when we do them and if we have them, we take them for granted. Uh, so understanding that not everyone can do this and what does it mean that I can. So, for example, one of my strengths is woo, which means winning others over. Um, and it means like being able to, or, you know, really enjoying connecting with, with strangers. And a lot of people think that's strange. So why would somebody want to do that? Um, 20 years ago, I met this woman at Target. We were looking for the same, you know, bathing suits for our kids. Um, and so we started talking, we exchanged numbers, and then it turned out we were neighbors and that our kids are going to be in the same swimming class. So we became friends and we've been friends ever since. But I told another friend of mine about this experience and that other person looked at me and said, who does that? Who just starts talking to people at Target? So at that time I was like, you're right, that's weird, I shouldn't do that. Had I known that this was something that I could leverage, I would have maybe made a few different choices along the way. So understanding that some things that people think are quirky or strange, again, it's something that we have that we do well and then understanding how to apply that to life uh, will help us achieve certain goals. Um, so just to give you an example of how this plays out. Um, when this, when this assessment originated, and it was about maybe 40 years ago, and it was uh, Don Clifton who asked the question, uh, what would happen if we focus on what we do well? And he conducted a study where, there was a study conducted at University of Nebraska, where they looked at um, two groups of readers, the average readers and above average readers. So they tested both groups. and. In that test, the average readers were scoring at 90 words per minute, and the above average readers were reading at 350 words per minute. Both groups went through the same speed reading class. So the average readers improved to 150 words per minute, which is great. But the time, uh, the above average readers, um, can anyone take a guess at how much they improved? Anyone want to write something in the chat box? 20 points, three times. OK. So they went up to 2,900, which is pretty incredible. So I, and I don't know how that works with speed readers, but that shows you that 
yes, if you focus on a weakness or something that you're not great at, of course you're going to improve um, and it's going to prevent failure. But if you focus on measuring a strength, it's going to lead to excellence. And that is what we want uh, everyone to do. Okay, I'm going to try this little poll with you guys. So, um, okay, let me just get to the space. So I'm going to ask a question, and then you're going to see a polling box appear. And it's going to be yes or no. So just click yes or no on your screen. So the first question is, click yes if you always talk to people in elevators, airplanes, and wherever you go. Okay. So kind of more or less almost half and a half. Okay, great. The next question is, click yes if you write down a list of things to do and stick to it. Okay, thank you for that one person that said no. Um, in this, this is the majority of the room always says yes, but there are always some that say no. Um, and again, there are reasons why some people are driven by lists, some people can't stand them. So, a lot, yes and no. I write lists, but I don't stick to it. Yes, exactly. A lot of people uh, add to it or they add things that they've already done. It, um, so that happens as well. So the next question is similar if you keep a list even on weekends. Okay. All right, so sometimes for many of us during, yeah, during the week or at work, we're more likely to need to remember a lot of details. Exactly. Okay, the next one is click yes if you need somebody, if you need some, to pick someone to race while driving. Okay, great. I, I love that I, you know, whenever I do get at least one, um, <laughs> depends on traffic, that is definitely connected to maybe one or two different uh, strengths. So, and what does that mean and how do we use that to our advantage in the future? Okay, just a couple more. Click yes if you ask lots of questions. Oh, here we go. Hang on. Okay. Again, at, that's normally a good thing. Um, one of my strengths is input, which is uh, connected to asking questions. Um, and then I remember once, now that I'm aware of this, when I was in seventh grade, my social studies teacher limited, it, limited me to three questions a day. So that was, I still remember it to this day. So um, that's when we have to, if we do this with you know, younger people, helping them figure out when to, when to use their strengths. Maybe not always. Um, and just a couple more. Click yes if you discover the plot of the film before others. Uh, those of you who clicked yes are probably fun to go to the movies with. Um, and last, second to last one. Hang on. If you push the elevator button to remind the elevator that you are there and waiting. Okay, and the last one, 
if you have an organized closet. Color coded or otherwise organized. Okay. So, okay. Um, so basically, I don't know if you guys can see each other's comments or if I'm the only one seeing the chats. Can, is everybody able to see the chats or is it just me? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, good. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so the point here is that people are different. We all know that. We're all wired differently. But it's not just our quirks or our personality. There's more to it than that. So if we have an organized closet in one house, we're going to have an organized closet probably in every house we live in going forward. Um, and again, once we understand where that comes from and our need for order or if it's something that motivates us you know, from the inside, then having that understanding will allow us then to apply it toward uh, whatever it is that we're doing uh, in life and ha in being able to work with other people better and more intentionally as well as ourselves. So that's the lesson number one. Lesson number two is uh, this. So, Again, if you can, um, on your poll, choose the animal that you think is the loudest creature in the ocean. So we have a, a killer whale, a seal, a pistol shrimp, and a jellyfish. All right, uh, killer whale has three. A lot of you have the CLB. Well, the answer is the pistol shrimp. Uh, this is all true. So, okay, so the pistol shrimp is about the size of a quarter. Um, let's say you're the manager of the ocean and you're looking to hire the loudest creature in the ocean. You're not going to think that the shrimp is the loudest creature unless the shrimp is able to or take that, right? So if you're the shrimp and you have a talent uh, that you need to make people aware of, having this understanding is going to give you that language to be able to do that. So the shrimp needs to know how to tell the manager of the ocean that they're the loudest and they can do a better job doing whatever the, the manager of the ocean will want them to do than what they perceive as some, someone louder, like the seal. So just knowing, again, where your strength com comes from and what it allows you to do. Uh, again, goes back to the who you are, what you do, and the how you do what you do. So the lesson here is that strength can't always be seen. So it's, it's for you to be comfortable with who you are, to be able to then use it and talk about it uh, in different types of situations. Um, so the point of this is that the Shrimp is able to use its strength to protect itself from predators in its own way. Um, a dolphin protects itself from predators by finding a pack and then using physical force to attack the predators. If the dolphin told the shrimp, hey, this is what I do. I look for a pack and then we you know, attack the predators. Why don't you try that? You try to find a pack of shrimp and attack you know, the shark using physical force. What's going to happen? Is that going to work? Probably not. And those shrimp are going to become the shark's lunch. So the way the shrimp is able to protect itself is by, it has this funny shaped claw. And it makes, uh, it traps an air bubble in its claw and squeezes it and makes like an, uh, a sonic sound that scares everybody away. Um, and that, that so it's, it, sometimes it kills a predator, sometimes it just scares them. But that's, how it's able to survive in the ocean. So the, the here is that you have to figure out your way of getting to the outcome and doing it your way, looking at the outcome and thinking about the process, not following somebody else's guidelines. What works best for somebody is not necessarily going to be what works best for you. I have a lot of people you know, talking about networking, and so they go to networking events with really extroverted friends and um, they try to copy, you know, what these other people are doing, and they, you know, even if they try to kind of emulate them, it still doesn't 
feel right and they're not doing they're not doing it in the best way that they could be doing it. So it's really figuring out, okay, this is what I need to do. This is who I am. How am I going to do this versus somebody else? So that's the lesson here. The thing with a shrimp, though, is that it's blind. So how does a shrimp know that there's a predator nearby? Uh, the shrimp and the goby fish have a symbiotic relationship, and this is also true. Um, so the goby fish sees the predator, wiggles its tail, and alerts the shrimp that there's a predator nearby. Uh, the shrimp then makes its sound, uh, and then the two of them are able to survive that way. So the point here is to find a complementary partner. One example I have here at work is that uh, I have a coworker who is great at Excel, which is not something that I enjoy and am good at. So I could spend a couple hours trying to figure out how to create a spreadsheet, or I could ask her, she could help me, we could do it together, and then maybe there's going to be something that I could help her with um, at another time. So finding a partner that can complement your strengths and uh, give you help where you need it and for you to be able to do the same. And that's really leveraging uh, team strengths or a partnership, um, et cetera. But none of us can do everything very well, so it's finding what we can do well and where can we use that and we uh, compensate for what we don't have. Okay. And then finally, so the, as we talked about before, the strength is something that comes from recognizing a talent. So it's a natural way of thinking, feeling, or behaving. Then once you identify that, uh, then it's spending time practicing, nurturing that um, talent, which then becomes a strength. So. If I asked you this, what are some talents, skills, and knowledge that professional firefighters need to have to be successful? What would you say? What are examples of talents, skills, or knowledge? You guys could just type them in. Strength, physical strength, yep. being calm under pressure, no fear. Okay, those are great. Okay. So let's say there is um, physically strong, okay, right equipment. Um, so some of them are examples of talent. Uh, maybe no fear, not having fear is an example of a talent. Being calm under pressure is an example of talent. Um, then you have some skill, right? Um, using the right equipment is a, is a skill and or knowledge. Um, being fit, physically strong. So those are all um, skills that you develop over time. So this is my friend's son who's four in this picture. He is calm under pressure. He's very brave. Um, would I send him into a burning fire at, this, at age four? No, of course not. So if I recognize in him these strengths, um, and if, let's say, he wanted to at some point become a fighter, that could be a good path for him, but nurturing the strengths and then developing the knowledge and skills along the way. Okay, that's a, an extreme example, but it sort of it helps you understand that if you have what it takes uh, to do a certain job, but then you need to acquire the skills, then that's the path that you can find for yourself. Um, as I was you know, doing a lot of research on strength, uh, one example I found was that there was a woman who was in medical school and she wanted to become a doctor and she didn't know what kind of doctor to become. So she did the strength finder and it turned out she didn't really relationship building strength. So she didn't want to be in the role where she would have to have long-term relationships with parent, patients. She wanted to go in and do a quick fix and then get feedback and be done with that person. So she became a dermatologist. So it allows you to be more intentional of finding the role in which you thrive, even if you have a sense of the industry or the interest that you're, uh, that you're aiming toward. Okay. So for the next piece, um, I, I, I guess no one has audio. Is, does anybody have audio? Because I was hoping to break you all up into small groups where you could talk together. Where can we do the participants? Okay. Um, all right, let's see if we could do this a different way then. Yeah, 
All right, you finished that one. So the lesson here is to develop your strengths over time. Um, the strengths, there are 34 total strengths, and they're all divided into four different domains. Um, so there's the executing domain, influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. So people with the executing domain, strengths in the executing domain, um, they have an internal drive, an internal motivator to complete things, to complete um, projects, it's all completion. It shows up in different ways, achievers a little bit different from responsibility, discipline, etc. but it's all about completing something. Influencing people have just a natural ability to deliver a message, to get buy-in, they're storytellers, they're presenters, they need a sounding board, um, they just need that outlet to be heard. Uh, relationship building um, people, ha their, you know, their focus is to connect with others and that is something that drives them to do anything else. So I don't have anything in my top 10 in the executing domain, but I do get things done. But the motivation for me comes from relationships. I don't want to let people down or I don't want them to think badly of me. So it's not an internal drive to complete something, but it might be just as strong um, that it, but it just comes from something that's external. And then the people with the strategic thinking uh, themes are really in their heads. They're thinking, they're ideating, they're brainstorming. Um, they, need, you know, they need context uh, in order to inform how they're going to be thinking about things. So some people ask, you know, is it better to be in all four or have all five in one domain? It doesn't matter because we all do all things. We all execute. We all influence. We have relationships and we process thoughts. But it's how you approach whatever it is that needs to be done. So if you need to get stuff done, you think about where the motivation comes from. If you need to influence people, it's, you know, if you don't have anything in your top five there, it's what else do you use in order to compensate for that. So it might be relationship building. It might be learner. Um, when I was talking about the different project managers before. I was working with a woman and she uh, was applying for jobs at Amazon, I think, and Google for project manager roles. And she had themes um, in executing and strategic thinking. And what she was saying was, or no, sorry, she was in executing and relationship building. And she was saying that what, um, the ones, the project managers that come in and they're really quick to come up with ideas and then they just, you know, they just tell people what they think and everyone follows. So she has trouble with that. So she was describing people with these two. So she is the opposite. The way she approaches project management is first to establish relationships with people, to really have an a under, understanding of how each person approaches their work um, and what, would, what are the challenges, what are the struggles, what works, what doesn't. And then once she has that knowledge, then she can put in place some new systems. So it's that combination that allows her to be just as successful as someone maybe with these themes as well. But it's really understanding how do you apply them to whatever it is that you need to be doing and how do you do it your own way. Um, so what I was hoping to have you all do is to look at your reports um, and then talk to each other about some ways that you've seen your strengths come out. But without audio, um, we could do it through chat, but I don't know if that's going to be hard. Um, or just, I can just kind of talk things through. We can try chat? Okay. Um, how many of you have your insights reports? If you could raise your hand. Okay. Okay, great. Looks like most of you have your insights report. Um, okay, I'm going to put you into different groups. And um, oh, am I back? Am I back, Marion? You all hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to put you into groups. Uh, so some of you who don't have your reports will be with others. So what I want. Um, uh, the ones that have reports to do is to kind of is to go through your report and share with your group one example that you might have highlighted from the descriptions that connects to an experience or a success. 
So, for example, if you have um, restorative is one of your top five, which is a natural problem solving uh, strengths. You see everything as a problem. You want to solve every every problem. Um, when did that? When were you successful doing that? When did that play out for you in your favor? Um, so I'm going to group you into maybe three or four different groups and have you all um, chat with each other uh, through that. So we'll try that. And I'll pop in from one group to another just to see if it's working. And if it's not working, I'll, I'll take you out. Okay. So um, all right, I'm going to do this. Okay, so now I'm on a screen where I can't see if you have your report because it's a different screen from um, from before. Michelle, if you have the other screen that shows that people that have reports, can uh, you? Uh, as a report. Um, okay, how about this? Instead, if I can just ask for a few volunteers um, to to write into a chat box if they have a connection to one of their strengths. So that way everybody else can see it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, Suzanne, you have a connection to communication. Can you say more where how that plays out for you in life, work or personal life? Glad you guys are. This is, this is sort of working. Okay, so um, okay. So the the. The goal of this, so get the Strength Finder is owned by Gallup. And so the process of really understanding what this all means and how, what do I do with this, it's a three part process. So the naming, claiming, aiming. So what you're all doing is um, naming. So you get this report with five words. And on, on their own, you know, it's, you might wonder what is so great about futuristic or learner or strategic and why is that a strength? So the naming process is understanding the power of the word. And when you go through the report and you find some of the phrases that resonate with you, um, and there's a difference on the insights report and the signature themes report. The signature report is um, everyone who has, let's say, a futuristic will have the same description and the same paragraph. On the insights report, that paragraph is customized for you with the other four. So that's how they're different. Um, but it's really making that connection. It's like, okay, I have futuristic. Um, this is how it plays out for me, which is great. So that's the connection. Um, you also want to be asking yourself, how has this served me in the past, or how does this serve me? And then, how can it serve the department and organization or others? 
So when you think about each of your strengths, it's uh, thinking about, you know, when I'm talking to a future employer uh, or if I'm working on a project or if I'm leading a team, how can I use this strength in order to move us forward or in order to have an impact? Um, so thinking about that. So those of you um, who shared something, if you want to think about like how you can take that next step and see where can you go with, with the one that you've mentioned before. And I wonder if we can um, save what you're all writing and sort of build as well. Um, but let's say, um, Jen, you just wrote empathy. I work to make sure our online classes are accessible to students with disabilities. Also, I feel like it allows me to work well with different types of groups at work. That's perfect. So um, that's how you can use it, you know, to talk about how this can, uh, how it can serve others, whether it's people, individuals, as well as a department. Um, Vanessa, achiever and input. I aim to always get my master's degree when I went from one opportunity. Good. Achiever and input. Yes, that is definitely an example of both of those. Um, so yeah, that's great before I thought that project management was a strength, but now I see that as an arranger why I am successful in this area. Um, great. So this is a really, this, I, I, I am trying to keep up with everything that all of you have written, but since this is the last one, so I just want to comment on what you said. Um, one thing that uh, I'm trying to do is to have like a pre and a post assessment for students or anyone I do this with. So for example, if I were to ask you, you know, what are some things that you do well before taking this? And if you were to say project management, that's great. This allows you to then go deeper. So, um, so one thing that you do well is arrange, you know, information or you're good at delegating or just seeing different pieces of a puzzle. Um, so you kind of go deeper, you know, with it, like let's say project management, the concept, into what it is that makes you good at it. Um, so it's thinking about that. Um, so I really hope that you spend some more time with both reports. Um, I'm happy to, you know, to answer any questions after this individually by phone or Skype or email, however, however that works for all of you as well. Um, or if there's another way you all want to connect with each other, uh, we can do that as well. So, so that's great. So you went through the naming process. And then the claiming process is uh, kind of even going beyond what you're writing here. So um, I emailed that worksheet out yesterday. So it's thinking about one of your themes that you love, and it doesn't have to be one of the ones that you already talked about um, in the chat, but if there is a theme that is it's like, this is, this is me, this is who I am, um, and this is what makes me able to do these great things. So if there's something that you love, uh, at the same time, there could be something, it could even be the same one, that drives you crazy, or others. Um, all the themes have an upside and a downside. So when you're using the theme in the kind of the intentional way that brings you good results, then it's in the balcony, so it's the upside. Um, when it takes over and uh, you kind of give into it and you're not able to make decisions, um, you know, objectively because you're sort of in that space of that theme, sometimes that can be the downside. So for example, I have empathy as well. And um, one thing with empathy is that you feel the other person's feelings. And so if I let empathy in too much, it, it then if I'm making decisions for somebody else or helping somebody else make a decision, um, sometimes I'm not as objective. So I've learned with empathy is that I have to experience it. I have to let it in. I have to connect with the other person. But then I recognize that it's there, and I push it aside so that I can still be as objective. But we have to be really aware of that. And that's the difference between um, just acting out of instinct or being able to control it. So um, I heard on one podcast the example of a dog, you know, when a dog sees a rabbit, they'll go after it. They won't say, okay, should I go chase the rabbit now? Or, you know, maybe I shouldn't because they're running across the street. But with this awareness, we have options. So we can use it or we can 
put it on hold. So it's something that we can experience. Um, I always think of it as using it as a, at a zero to five, if you think of it like a dial. So you could be operating at a five or a zero or anywhere in between. Um, okay, so Jen, you wrote, yes, yeah, sometimes something I have trouble with pushing empathy. Yes, I mean, that's empathy is hard. And um, me, um, my, uh, our director sits next to me, and so she hears me sometimes with one of my kids, and she's like, you are in the basement of empathy which really helps because if I can't pull myself out of it, having somebody else that can hear that and take you out of that uh, is really, really important. So whether it's in your family, friends, uh, on your team, um, being able to have this language that you can tell, you know what, um, I might approach the, you this way or I might react this way. Um, I had somebody with Activator ask me how to get um, people to, you know, she needed to email people to get things done, but because of Activator, she's like, I need things now, but she didn't want to come off as a nag or, or drive them away. So it's like really thinking about, okay, I have this, this is what I need, but in order for me to get what I need from other people, I have to sort of tone this down. So that's where one of your themes could drive you crazy. All right, Vanessa, being an achiever, I can make others feel that they are not doing enough or with Yes, that is definitely um, an achiever thing. So if you're if you're an achiever and you're managing people, that comes out. If you're an achiever and your supervisor is not, um, then that comes out. Well. Um, uh, so it's it's just being able to understand where your reactions are coming from, and then what do you do with them? Um, Good, great examples, you guys. I mean, I, I think that it's it's starting to click for you, which is which is great. Uh, that's the first step. So I encourage you to kind of start paying attention to how these are coming out for you, you know, every day. And you know, maybe it means like focusing on one theme a day or one for the week. Will your themes change with experience? So I've taken it twice, maybe three um, apart, and so. Um, I was really attached to my results from the first time. And when I got different results, I was a little bit disappointed because I kind of learned what to do with that. Um, but when I got to know the second set of results, it turned out really that um, what was my third and fourth moved to six and seven, and what had been my six and eight moved to three and four. And that is really, like the second time I took it, is really who I am. So I would say that where you are in life, if you're dealing with a transition or if you're dealing with unexpected stress, you might be pulling in strengths that you're dominant, but you need them for the experience. Um, so I would say if your strengths don't completely resonate for you, then maybe in a, two years or longer to, re, to then retake it and see. But if it's... Um, if, once you go through it, if you're finding that some of the um, the phrases do resonate, then it's really that is probably in your top not if not your top five, but your top ten because our dominant could be one through seven or eight or nine or ten. Um, yes, there is a way you can see Samantha um, top ten. What other the other five are? You can buy um, you can buy the the all 34. Um, it, co it costs, I think, 60 or 70 dollars. Um, people with learner and input are the ones that are usually eager to get the full 34. Um, so it's I got all 34 when I went through the certification. But a lot of people, you know, they want to see all 34. If you can get, if you're working somewhere and they want to do strengths and they are willing to pay for it. Um, you know that would be something. To see if you can if you can get them. Uh, but I think it is also a good investment. You know if if you can do it to know um, the sixth and seventh. You, you might know what's missing from your top five if you feel strongly that there's one or two that should be there and aren't. So they're probably your six and seven. Um, but if you want confirmation for that, you can at some point get your results because Gallup will have them stored. Um, and then, and then after you have this understanding of what it means for you, it's what do you do differently now that you have this? So um, it's the aiming process. 
So how can you be more intentional? Um, again, like let's say I'm going back to Wu. Um, now that I know what it can do, I don't have to use it. If I'm sitting next to someone on the airplane, I don't have to talk to them, even if it is a natural, if it's comfortable or, you know, it's like this natural reaction. Um, I did this for a woman who has Wu. She was probably, um, I don't know, in her late 50s, and she had just moved to Boston from I don't know where, and she joined a gym, and she was saying how everyone was so unfriendly because she would go to the gym, and she would just start talking to people, but no one kind of recated. So yes, she had Wu. It was one of her top five, but she also didn't have to use it just because she was able to, just because she was comfortable. So now like I go to conferences, and I love going to conferences. I love meeting strangers. I can choose, do I want to go up to people and talk to them, introduce myself to them, which is totally fine, I can, but I can also wait and do it a little bit later. I could do it, you know, three hours later once I have a sense of, you know, who I want to meet or where I want this to go because um, it's happened before that I would do it without thinking and then create a relationship that shouldn't have been created for some reason. So. Um, having this understanding, again, allows you to be more intentional about when to use what you have and how to use what you have. Um, any questions? Any other thoughts? Um, let's see, any other questions that I'm missing here? So, uh, for career considerations, um, again, depending on where all of you are in your professional roles, um, I do work with people who want to make sure that they're in the right role. They're not necessarily unhappy, but they want to know more about themselves. Uh, the self-awareness piece is um, a process. So um, having this insight can allow you to think about where you are. One thing I do with teams sometimes is I have them think about the five things that they do, that I guess that they're paid to do, five, five things that they do in their jobs. And then um, I can send you a sheet with about 65 different things that uh, correspond to what you do best. So use 10 of those um, and see if you get to do in your jobs what you do best to see if you're in a role that allows you to thrive. And then, if it's yes, that's great. If the answer is no, the first question is, can you change anything about your circumstances? Sometimes it's even physical space. If you're a more social person, can you be in a more social place physically? Um, so is there anything you can do to change your environment? Um, or if you, you know, if you are looking to make a, a bigger change, then it's like, what is it that you need and how are you going to get that and how are you going to ask questions and informational interviews to get at some of this information. Um, so that's something that you know we talk about when we talk about uh, career transitions. Um, are there certain types of jobs that these strengths can play into? Well, yes and no. So um, I think you know some people, uh, especially when we work with undergrads, um, they have a lot of different interests and they don't really know what to focus on. But again, your strengths might be tied to a specific role, but the industry could be based on your interests. So it's figuring out what motivates you. Um, one, one example I'll give you is that uh, I was working with another alum and he was starting a job at um, Lincoln Labs. He was an engineer. He was really excited about that and he wanted to think about like future goals. So you know, what, five, ten years from now. So we did strengths, and it turned out that his successes in life came from times when there was a lot of competition, and that really drove him. So that kind of made him rethink how he approaches thinking about goals. So instead of thinking about the five-year or ten-year goal, and does he want to be a CEO, but it's structuring his life now that there's competition in his life uh, professionally, where he can, you know, where he can thrive, and that's where he'll be successful. And then that's going to essentially shape his path to the future. So there are people who set goals in different ways, but it's figuring out what do you need now 
and how can you build your life uh, in order for you to have that in your life. So um, there's just different ways to think about that depending on your strengths as well. Um, so for some people who have achiever, it's, you know, what drives them is being able to achieve more and more and do projects. So being busy, um, being needed. So that might be the goal is to kind of make sure that the jobs would have that component instead of thinking as an end result, do I want to become this or that? Um, okay. So I don't know, Vanessa, if I answered your question. Okay, Christine, would you prepare for Gallup profiling or similar theme? Should you I'm not sure if I understand, Christine, your question. Um, so uh, I don't know if you can rephrase it, but I'm happy to try to answer that. Oh, you had a similar test for the interview. Um, well, that's OK. So you shouldn't, I mean, yes, there are companies that give assessments for interviews. But um, this is something that's for you. So like for you to know how to answer certain questions. Um, also knowing how to prepare for an interview. So for example, if you have influencing and or relationship building themes, that's going to come out for you during the interview as being able to connect with the interviewer. If you don't have that, then how do you leverage what you do have in order to achieve the same result? Um, okay. You should be, yes. Yes, you should always look for jobs. And that's the other thing, you know, with so many people who are graduating and they say, oh, I'm sending out 20 to 50 resumes a week. Well, you don't want to be doing this again in a year. So the more effort you can make into finding that right fit for yourself now, the more likely you won't have to be doing this again in a year or two. Um, so uh, really being more, I guess, strategic or uh, thoughtful of how you approach your professional life. Um, OK, good. I'm glad, Christine, that that worked out. Um, OK, we have just a few more minutes. I have this story to end with. Um, OK, thanks, Ruth. Keep in touch if you have any other questions. So there's a fable of the tortoise and the scorpion. Um, the scorpion is trying to cross the river and is asking a lot of animals to help him cross the river. And everyone's saying no, because they know the scorpion is going to sting them. So the scorpion approaches the turtle and says, you know, turtle, can you take me across the river? And the tortoise, turtle says, no, scorpion, you're going to sting me, and then we're both going to drown. And the scorpion says, why would I do that? If I do that, we're both going to drown. What would be the point of that? And the turtle says, you're right, you know, hop on. So they're halfway across the river, and the scorpion, uh, and the tur turtle uh, feels a sting and says, scorpion, why did you do that? You just stung me. Now we're both going to drown. And the scorpion says, I'm a scorpion. It's in my nature. So uh, again, that's my point about fit, is you, if you have communication, you want to be in a place where you're going to be able to be the person that if you need to talk to people, you won't be happy in, a, in isolation or in a, an environment where people don't talk. If you have input, if you have learner, you need to have opportunities to always be learning, to collect information. <coughs> so really be sure that you're putting your pl yourself in a place where your strengths are going to work for you and not against you. Um, so, uh, so again, thinking more about your interests and then the role that you can play within that, that place, in that field. So Suzanne, let me see what you wrote. Um, so this is something I hear all the time. I have a really good friend who works for a think tank. People don't go to lunch with each other. They just work at their desks. She is miserable. So she's trying to figure out how to ask questions in, in interviews to find out what the social culture is like. So it's kind of really thinking, uh, putting a lot of effort into the types of questions that you're going to be asking. Like what is the work culture like? What, um, how do people collaborate? together. Um, oh, that's awful. OK, so, so that says something, definitely. So Suzanne, if you want to you know, Skype in or you know, do more work with this, we can definitely 
definitely do, do some do some more. Um, I'm going to ask about. I'm what the dynamic. Yes, exactly, exactly. You want to know what that is before you go in there. So my my last thoughts are um, to think about what you've learned today and, and the phrases that you've underlined. I would say share your reports with your mentor or a family member or a friend and see if they see you in the description. Um, and then just having this awareness, building on that, and seeing like kind of experimenting with that. With every interaction, you have options. You can say things in different ways. You can approach people in different ways. Um, so experiment and think about, OK, what is the thing that you would do naturally or instinctively? Or should you modify that if you want to get a different result? Couldn't be great. So I'm, I'm glad that that's, that worked out, Suzanne. Any, any other thoughts? Any last comments or thoughts? Positivity. Yes, yeah, Suzanne, I have, um, I have positivity as well. I love positivity. Um, can I, send, I can send you the slides as a PDF, I think. Yes. But this is also recorded, so you can go in and view this again as well. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you guys, I'm glad you enjoyed this. So we can definitely do this again. And if you're going to be joining us for part two, um, let, let us know. And maybe we can figure out how to make this more interactive if you guys don't have audio. <clears throat> and Anne, thank you. Thank you so much. It's clear that you have a real depth of expertise around strengths and shared some really great examples, answered our questions, and helped us think about different angles of how to use strengths. And I hope people will come back. And thanks to the group for great participation, which I know isn't easy through chat, but I think we accomplished that. And I hope people will join us for the second session on August 10th, um, where we can hear how to apply this to the job search. So thanks again to Anne for a very engaging and participatory session. Thanks so much. Um, Dan, if you want to reach out, I'm happy to you know, have an offline conversation with you as well. So feel and free to. We work with alums, so you guys don't hesitate to send us an email if you want to go deeper into it. Well, have a great day, and hope to see you next week. Thanks again, everyone.